The Index Astartes, a history of the Space Marine Legions and subsequent chapters, where appropriate, up to the 13th Black Crusade. The Raven Guard. The Raven Guard specialise in devastating strikes behind enemy lines, guerrilla warfare, and rapid reaction to enemy manoeuvres. During the Great Crusade, the Raven Guard conquered countless worlds, fought impregnable by the precise application of force at the enemy's weakest point. At the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, the Raven Guard was almost destroyed, and only by employing the most desperate measures was the Legion saved. Of the early history of the Raven Guard's Primarch Korax, very little is known. The Raven Guard's own legends are vague concerning the pale-skinned youth, who was raised on the mineral-rich but desolate moon of Lysias. This moon orbited Kiavar, a technologically advanced planet, its surface covered with sprawling machine shops and forged cathedrals. Lysias was exceedingly rich in mineral wealth and populated by exiles from the planet below, who lived in crude force domes that protected them from the vacuum of space. The ruling tech guilds of Kirva used the mine works on Lysias as a dumping ground for their worst criminals and those who could not meet their production quotas. Heavily armed overseers ruled the moon from a dark mountain spire that towered above the mine works. It was, for all intents and purposes, a death sentence to be banished to Lysias. Ancient, faded texts from the chapter Librarius of the Raven Guard tell that the inhabitants of Lysias had long been the slaves of Kervar and had worked in the massive mines under armed guard in horrendous conditions. Accidents killed many of the workers and the polluted atmosphere took a heavy toll on the health of their children. Once condemned to a life in the mines, there was no escape and the slaves of Lysias prayed to the Emperor for a saviour. He came in the form of a child whose skin was as white as snow. There are many stories concerning the discovery of Korax and the truth of the matter may never be known. One tale tells of a cave-in that claimed the lives of hundreds of slaves mining beneath a glacier and revealed a hidden chamber containing the infant Primarch. Another speaks of a fiery comet that broke apart on a massive mountain of iron and a child wreathed in ghostly light who walked unscathed from the rubble. Yet another talks of a dying warrior giant, delivering the babe to the slaves and begging them to protect the infant from the Dark Ones. Whatever the circumstances, the slaves of Lysias took the white-skinned babe with midnight black hair and named him Korax, which means the Deliverer. They hid the infant from their jailers and raised him as one of their own. Within the space of a few years, when his abnormal maturation became obvious, the slaves rejoiced, seeing him as a sign of favour from the Emperor. They trained the young Primarch in all manner of skills. The varied backgrounds of the exiles giving Korax a thorough grounding in urban warfare, sabotage, demolition and killing. They taught him all the qualities they believed a general and leader would need. Korax learned at an astonishing rate. His strength, keen intellect and taciturn demeanour made him a quick and ferocious learner. From the earliest age, Korax had been told that it was his destiny to save the people of Lysias, and as the years passed, he began sowing the seeds that would bring about their freedom. With the slaves' limited resources, only the crudest of weapons could be fashioned, and great stockpiles of these were hidden in secret caches throughout the mineworks and key strategic points. Korax organised the slaves into storm squads, appointed competent leaders, and drilled them thoroughly in their assigned tasks. He also began psychological warfare on their jailers, organising regular strikes and staging riots that stretched the garrison's resources thinly and sapped the guards' morale. Each event was choreographed to seem like a gradual build-up of pressure, and soon Lysias was a powder keg waiting to explode. When the time came, Korax and his trained squads of slaves struck, Massive mining machines were driven through the streets and key security points. Sabotage teams armed with rock drills and las cutters were able to sever power lines, communications and life support to many of their enemy's strong points. One particular dome, home to a significant portion of Lysias' military might, was shut off completely, exposing its occupants to the hard vacuum of space. Simultaneously, Korax and a 
small group of his deadliest warriors assaulted the fortress-like tower of their taskmasters and captured it in a single night's fighting. After centuries of abuse, there could be no mercy for those who had kept the slaves in bondage, and every prisoner taken was executed. The tech guilds of Carava were shocked at the fall of Lysaeus and immediately dispatched troops to crush the rebellion. The war was short and brutal. Sitting at the top of Long Gravity Well, Korax's troops were able to bombard the planet from afar with large containers laden with crude atomic charges that laid waste to vast portions of Kirvar's industrial landscape. When troops from Kirvar did land on the moon to fight, Korax was there with his hand-picked warriors. The raven-haired Primarch outthought and outfought his enemies at every turn. Surgical strikes decapitated the Kiavar command structure, destroyed the enemy's supply lines, and kept them on the defensive. In the end, Korax was to prove victorious, and the Kiavar troops withdrew as their planet's economy collapsed without the mineral resources of Lysias to plunder. Kiavar descended into anarchy as the various tech guild factions fought amongst themselves for control of the remaining materials still on the planet. The celebrations on Lysias went on for many days, and in memory of their victory, the slaves renamed their home Deliverance. The most complete record of the Great Crusade, the Speculum Historial, has little to say on the matter of Korax reuniting with the Emperor of Mankind. It is left to the Raven Guard's librarians to recall how such a momentous event came about, and as always, there is much that is shrouded in mystery. It is said that during the victory celebrations, the Emperor descended to Deliverance to find Korax waiting for him, curious to meet this stranger who had landed alone on his world. The Emperor spoke to Korax for a day and a night, but whatever passed between them is unrecorded. At dawn the following day, Korax accepted command of the Raven Guard Legion of Space Marines and took his place at the Emperor's side. One condition of Korax's acceptance was that the Emperor had to lend his assistance to bring peace to Kirvar. Peace through force of arms, but peace nonetheless. Already reeling from their defeat on Deliverance and unable to muster a coherent force against the Raven Guard, the tech guilds were broken and the Adeptus Ministorum stepped into the void left by their destruction. Mineral production soon began again on Deliverance under a much improved regime and gradually the world of Kirvar was rebuilt under the guidance of the Imperium. The Dark Tower that had once housed the slaves' oppressors now became the fortress of the Raven Guard and was renamed the Raven's Spire. The Great Crusade saw Korax lead the Raven Guard in some of the most stunning victories of that turbulent time. He had not forgotten the training he had received on deliverance, and his talents for sabotage and precision planning were employed to great effect in the Emperor's Crusade. Planets fought impregnable, fell to Korax's guile and the swift, deadly actions of the Raven Guard. Assassinations, covert operations behind enemy lines, and sabotage became the watchword of the Legion, and in these areas, their skill was unmatched. Korax became a master at observing a planet's power structure and applying military pressure where needed to topple its leaders or cripple its military capabilities. The full force of the Raven Guard Legion was seldom required, but when it was, Korax would not hesitate to throw every warrior into battle. Korax's legion garnered such a fearsome reputation that the war master Horus requested its aid many times in his campaigns, and it is thought that it was thanks to the Raven Guard's assistance that Horus's tally of victories was so high. The Raven Guard's records are curiously reticent concerning this period of history, and Imperial historians suspect that the taciturn Korax did not like the more gregarious Horus and found him overly boastful and manipulative. It is rumoured that, on one occasion, the two almost came to blows, and bloodshed was only averted when Korax removed his legion from the War Master's command. The two Primarchs were never to meet again, and when the Horus heresy tore the galaxy apart in the first interlegionary war, the Raven Guard fought alongside the Iron Hands and Salamanders. All three legions were ordered to assault Horus's headquarters on the planet of Istvan V and destroy it utterly. Four supporting legions were close on their heels, ready to reinforce the initial landings and consolidate the invasion. Horus had turned his back on the Emperor, but had lost none of the cunning that had earned him the title of War Master. The Loyalist legions were badly mauled on their initial landings, and casualties were appalling. The forces of the Great Betrayer 
were heavily fortified. Then after fierce fighting, the Loyalist legions were forced to fall back to link up with their supporting legions. The landing zones had been fortified by the Iron Warriors, and when the retreating troops reached the fortifications, they came under a withering hail of fire from their erstwhile allies. Unknown to the legions on the planet, Horus had managed to corrupt four of the seven legions sent against him. Caught between the enemy they were already fighting and a surprise attack, the Loyalists were shattered, and barely a handful were able to escape Horus's trap and warn the Emperor of this wholesale betrayal. His legion shattered, Korax returned to Deliverance with orders to rebuild it as quickly as possible. It was a bleak time for the Primarch of the Ravenguard. The Imperium was teetering on the brink of collapse and desperately needed brave warriors, but he had none to give. A desperate situation called for desperate measures, and Korax locked himself within the shadowed chambers of the Raven Spire's Librarius to pour over volumes of forgotten lore in search of a solution. His researches led him back to the earliest days of genetic manipulation, when accelerated zygote harvesting techniques were used to create the first enhanced warriors with which the Emperor had long ago pacified terror. Korax realised that this process could be modified to produce full-grown space marines at a frightening rate, but the ancient tomes also warned of the terrible dangers involved and the unspeakable monsters that could result. Though he knew he risked destroying his legion, he reluctantly ordered the apothecaries to begin the process. Not the apothecaries' first creations, nothing is known for sure. The Raven Guard's records have been sealed with oaths and sigils of unspeakable power, and none of the members of the chapter will speak of those blighted days. Accounts culled from other sources are few and far between, as the Raven Guard shunned the other legions at this time and preferred to fight alone and unseen. One apocryphal tale is told of the room priests of the Space Wolves, the so-called Saga of the Weregeld, tells of a ferocious monsters, drooling and almost insane with bloodlust, herded into combat by the Battle Brothers of the Raven Guard. Perhaps the Space Wolves' experiences with the Curse of the Wolven made them more sympathetic to the Raven Guard's plight, as there is no record of them reporting the use of such forbidden technology. Barely one in ten of these abominations could even hold a bolter gun. But among these, there might be one in a hundred whose genetic structure was stable enough to develop into a full-fledged space marine. Years passed, and the galaxy burned with war. Korax and his band of space marines gradually rebuilt their legion, and played parts where they could. The Raven Guard's talents for operating in small squads behind enemy lines offset its lack of resources, and its skill in this aspect of warfare were fully incorporated into the Raven Guard combat doctrine, Korax's ability to see weak points in a defence and apply precise force allowed his troops to fight battles of their choosing and to keep casualties to a minimum. The Raven Guard simply did not have the troops to operate in large-scale actions, and it was nearly a century after the heresy ended before the Legion was able to deploy in meaningful numbers of full battle brothers. Korax had rebuilt his Legion, but at a cost. The dungeons below the Raven Spire echoed with the howls of the apothecary's creations, bestial monstrosities who hungered for battle, and Korax agonised over what should be done with them. He decreed that none should discover the terrible price his legion had paid in order to survive, and his final solution was to administer the Emperor's peace to each and every failed creation personally, and pray for their souls and his own as he did so. Following the heresy, Rebute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, became the de facto head of the Imperium's armed forces, and one of the first edicts in his holy tome, the Codex Astartes, was that the Space Marine Legions be split into smaller units known as chapters. Among many of the Primarchs, there was resistance, but Korax welcomed the decision and knew that Gilliman's vision of the future was true. Thus, the Raven Guard were able to give rise to three other chapters, the Black Guard, the revilers and the raptors. Like everything in Korax's life, his ultimate fate is shadowed in darkness. It is said that following the breakup of the legions and the re-establishment of imperial rule in the galaxy, Korax locked himself in the highest tower of the Ravenspire and prayed to the Emperor for forgiveness for what he had done to his legion. Whether he received the absolution he required, no one will ever know. But a year to the day after he had entered the tower, Korax emerged haggard and wild-eyed. He left Deliverance, 
that very night on a course for the Eye of Terror, never to be seen again. He left but a single word as his valediction. Never more. The Saga of the Weregeld Only on the darkest of nights do the room priests of the Space Wolves tell the Saga of the Weregeld, a tale reaching back to the years of reconquest following the defeat of Horus's traitor legions. Over flickering fires they tell of the storming of the Jarilfa Palace, one of the bloodiest battles to follow the victory on terror. A force of iron warriors retreating from their defeat took refuge on the world of Sagatama VI and wrested control of the mighty fortress from the planet's rulers. Led by one of the iron warriors' greatest champions, the traitors turn the once majestic palace into a nightmare assembly of bunkers, redoubts and pillboxes. Ornamental gardens, once the envy of Paradium itself, were scarred with miles of trenches and razor wire. More than a million men of the Imperial Guard laid siege to the palace, and the battles fought in the sprawling grounds of the palace were thankless and bloody. The traitors defended every metre of ground with ferocious tenacity. However, one by one the gates leading to the inner keep fell, until only one last gate stood between the Space Wolves and final victory. The Iron Warriors are masters of siegecraft, and for all their bravery the Space Wolves could not capture the gate. Time and time again, two mighty champions of the Iron Warriors would hurl the greatest of the Space Wolves from the gateway, and it seemed nothing could break the defence of the traitors. As dawn broke on the hundredth day of the siege, warriors in black armour, their shoulder guards emblazoned with a white raven, arrived as if from thin air and assaulted the gateway with drooling and insane beasts herded before them. Horrifically misshapen, the monsters roared with howls of such mindless savagery that it chilled even the hearts of the space wolves, who remembered the curse of the wolven that existed within their own bodies. Nothing could halt the creatures, neither bullets nor blades, and the monsters swept through the gateway and killed anything that came within reach of their bloody claws. The sons of Russ looked on, Amazed, as the beasts and the raven guard fought their way into the palace and broke the back of the Iron Warriors' defence. A bare handful of Iron Warriors escaped the slaughter, but many more died that day, torn to pieces by the raven guard's bestial allies. With the battle over, the raven guard vanished as suddenly as they had arrived, leaving only the dismembered corpses of those they had slain. Only within the walls of the Fang would those space wolves present that day speak of what they had seen and whether they felt pity or revulsion at the sight of the ferocious beasts that bore the unmistakable vestige of humanity is not recorded. Ajaz Solari, 5th Company Captain The captain of the 2nd Company of the Raven Guard is notorious for leading assault squads into battle on a regular basis. A tall man, even for a space marine, Ajaz's paper-white skin and ebony hair speak of his long years of service to the chapter. Recruited from Deliverance itself, Captain Solari comes from the most ancient of families on the large moon. His ancestors descended from the original slaves. His ferocity and combat prowess are legendary in his chapter, as is his disregard for formality. Over his 23 years in his current commission, Solari's performance has been erratic but highly successful. His ability to work within any situation and meet the changing needs of the battlefield is unquestionable, but there have been times when Solari has left more to luck than tactical doctrine would dictate. At times he has had brilliant successes, at others disastrous failures. At his core, Solari is a gambler, willing to play the fates to win a battle and only his track record has spared him the ignominy of a court-martial. Combat Doctrine The Raven Guard follows the dictates of the Codex Astartes closely, though the Legion differs in the tactical application of its troops. The Raven Guard depends heavily on scout forces, able to act alone for extended periods of time, and rapid reaction forces such as assault troops equipped with jump packs. Commonly, the Raven Guard will deploy tactical squads in drop pods or Thunderhawks in response to intelligence gathered by their scouts. The chapter's excellence in covert operations makes engaging in a frontal battle seldom necessary. Where possible, the Raven Guard will use a precise application of force to cripple the enemy 
and avoid a protracted engagement. Dreadnoughts of the Raven Guard, while rare, are also quite commonly deployed via drop pods. This approach has created a chapter that can assemble its forces extremely rapidly and can react quickly to unexpected developments. When its numbers were limited during the days of the Horus Heresy, the chapter's troops became experts in guerrilla warfare. This expertise persists to this day, and the chapter very rarely utilizes heavily armored vehicles. Organization After the massacre on Isvan V, the Raven Guard had to make do with elder armor and equipment. The resources were simply not available to re-equip the troops. Even today, there is a high percentage of ancient suits of armor in the chapter, more than most others. The owners of these suits view themselves as blessed by the Primarch and fight to prove themselves his equal. The Raven Guard's ability to deploy troops in vital locations is legendary, and its mastery of rapid troop movements has been studied by many other chapters. In several documented cases, the precise application of force in the right place has quelled many rebellions before they truly began. However, the primary strength of the Raven Guard is the ease of its deployment, with most of the chapter's space marines usually being deployed in drop pods or otherwise mobile. They can rapidly reassess a combat situation before engaging, which gives them the ability to deal effectively with a rapidly changing battlefield. Beliefs To the Raven Guard, the Emperor is a distant figure who is acknowledged as the founder and master of the galaxy, but who is not accorded the level of worship common among other chapters. Korax is revered as the chapter's father and leader, and is worshipped as a man capable of making tough choices when the need was great. The chapter follows in his footsteps, and post-action sermons, utilising data recordings from the battle, are later compiled by the chapter's warriors. Much of the chapter's current tactical doctrine has evolved from meditations on past battles. For the leaders of the Raven Guard, tactical prowess and personal initiative are seen as more important than mere might. The Raven Guard prefer a swift dagger to the heart over a protracted battle where possible, though if heavy assault is needed, the chapter will not hold back. These beliefs cause tension with other chapters, particularly the Blood Angels, who the Raven Guard see as brutish and clumsy. Gene Seed The Gene Seed of the Raven Guard is far from stable, and a great deal of its gene stock has become irreparably damaged, perhaps as a side effect of the accelerated gene harvesting techniques employed many millennia ago. As a result, much of the Raven Guard's genetic material has to come from Terra, and the cycle of recruitment for the chapter is much slower than others. Few are capable of undergoing the transformation from normal human to space marine, and many die in training, thereby further limiting the chapter's numbers. Further deterioration has caused several of the unique space marine organs of the Sons of Korax to cease functioning as they should, while others are not as effective as they once were. For example, the zygote cultures required to grow the mucronoid and betcher's gland do not exist, and a mutated, melanchromic organ causes the skin of the space marine to grow paler after years of service. Eventually, each raven guard will be as white as Korax, and his hair and eyes will darken and become black as coal. Battle Cry Specialising in covert operations and debilitating fast strikes, the Raven Guard do not have a battle cry as such. Instead, the chapter's motto is simply Victorious Out Mortis. There you go, the Raven Guard. I think they've been one of the chapters that's received the least, the least love. I mean, up until the heresy, anyway. But uh, they are one of my favourites, and that's mostly to do with the uh, Primark novel by Guy Haley, which delves into Korax and... Um, yeah, the, the the sort of contradiction in the guy's soul. Uh, he's a rebel. He's a rebel leader, but uh, he serves a tyrant. And I thought that was quite nice. It was a nice way of exploring those ideas within the heresy, or the Great Crusade, I should say. Of course, we all know, spoiler alert, Korax is alive and hunting down, trying to hunt down Lorgar, but it appears he's got trapped in the war um, because the warps, you know, all magic and that and time don't matter. <laughs> and the gods and stuff. So he's, he's hunting down... He's hunting down Lorgar and the word bearers, and lots of word bearers disappear from an invisible man. And it doesn't mention here, of course, that he is invisible, which seems to be something that was developed in the heresy uh, that wasn't there before, his particular skill. 
But yeah, uh, good character, good character. And yeah, like I say, that Primark novel, if you're not too keen on Korax and the Raven Guard, the Horus Heresy ones, again, <laughs> it's going to sound like dead negative, isn't it? Um, I'm not keen on <laughs> what was like the Salamanders. I'm not keen on what was done with them within most of the Heresy. A couple of the books, like Deliverance Lost and stuff, I thought it was a bit sloppy, what was done with them in the Heresy, showing this thing where they rebuilt their strength using these tech things. I thought that was, I didn't enjoy that. <laughs> I thought it could have been done a lot better. But the, the Primark novel is excellent. I can't say anything against that. It is amazing. So that saved it for me, really. Definitely worth picking up if you can and uh, you want to know more about the Raven God. I do recommend it. There's some really interesting ideas in there about his, his inner conflict in terms of who he is and what his role is and you know his particular talents and outlook on the world. And the, uh, a certain amount of hypocrisy that he's well aware of. But anyway, I'm going to go. Thank you all for watching. I'll be back again soon. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the channel. You can see your names here. Please do remember to like the video. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Share if you think you know someone who might enjoy this. And, uh, yeah, I'll be back for more soon. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.